The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Franklin Templeton. At Franklin Templeton, we value the power of partnership and offer our clients a gateway to investment excellence. We bring together leading investment managers with specialized capabilities, providing investors access to a broad range of fixed income, equity, alternatives, and multi-asset strategies through one trusted global partner. Above all else, we always stay true to our commitment to create better financial futures together. Connect with us today at franklintempleton.com.au. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I'm James Wrigley. Got the pleasure of catching up with Ash McCall, Senior Advisor at True Wealth. Ash, thank you for joining me today for a chat. My pleasure, mate. Always, always fun to have a chat with you. I haven't, uh, I haven't caught up for a little while and I haven't sent you a message and say, hey, do you want to do a podcast with me? Uh, lots of people will know Ash. Ash has been around financial advice for for a while. Lots of different roles, lots of different businesses. Working in unis, working so you know, had your own business there for a while. You know, employee and others. So Ash, pleasure to speak with you. True well. So maybe let's let's start with what you're up to today. I want to get into some of your history and share some of. We we're talking before we press record. Some of the maybe kind of managing teams of people that you've had in some of your other roles, but. Um, what are you up to these days? What, what are you doing now? Yeah, so so working at True Wealth, it's a self licensed firm based out of Queensland. Um, and look, the the role I was looking for, which uh, you know, so as land me where I am, is one where I can uh, sort of work remotely, work from home. Um, whereas a lot of my other roles have been have required a long commute, and that sort of. I've got got fairly tired of that, and and the opportunity to to work at home is just too good to uh, to pass up. So yep. that's that's sort of the that's what I like about this business and this role. So, so you you're fully remote. Tell yeah, tell everyone where you live. So you you don't yep. live in Queensland. You're at the other yeah. end of the country. Where, where do you live? Right. Yeah. So I live in Bendigo, and most most of the roles I've had have been based in, in CBD Melbourne or or just in the suburbs. So yeah. that when you've got three young kids, that takes a lot out of your day. Um, and so other roles have had to be sort of one or two days being able to work from home, or or um, with a lot of the roles, it's just been five days in the office, mm. and yeah, you know, that's a, that's a four hour round trip. Yeah, basically. I know, so I know from your Instagram, like was, you, was looking, you from, from your Instagram, you used to share like you'd be you'd be on the train at five o'clock in the morning or something like that, and then you'd, you'd be cursing V line because they'd cancelled the trains back again, and you you're on on the bus oh, or something to yeah. get to get back home again. I can understand why you'd want a remote job rather than trying to commute to and from the Melbourne CBD. Yeah. A bus replacement is the, the two worst words I could hear when, <laughs> especially if I was running like at a long day or something at seven o'clock, and all of a sudden your your hour and forty train commute turned into a two and a half hour bus yeah. ride. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Bit, so so it, it, that was fairly tough. Um, all of that commuting, it was it was easier when I was a little bit younger and didn't have kids and that sort of things. But it's you know, if you get a little bit older and your kids get a little bit older and you, you start realizing you're missing things, so. Um, very, very much a a lifestyle decision to to seek remote work. Yep. Um, and yet, role at True Wealth came up, and and I'm well, I think I'm just about the oldest person in in the business. So it's a very, very young person's firm. Yeah. Uh, so I do feel a little bit older, which I'm not used to that. You know, when, when I first started, I was you know, was one of the younger people in the profession at the start. So a lot of people didn't start in there. This I was. 21 or 22 when I started. So yeah. a lot of people didn't start in advice. They were sort of late 20s at least. So I've gone from being, you know, I understand how it feels to be one of the older, older people in the room now, which take, I take a little bit of getting used to. With the, with the jobs kind of working in or around the Melbourne CBD and, and kind of in, in the suburbs, did, did you and your family ever consider moving 
closer. Like that, you know, lifestyle sounds like it's a big, a big thing for you, a big driver for you, uh, and and no doubt why you live where you where you do live. Did you ever consider moving closer? Can you talk about that? Yeah, look, the thought the thought sort of crossed my mind a couple of times, particularly while I was sitting on a bus instead of a train and yeah. those, those sort of things. Um, but look, the the cost of living differential between living in regional Australia versus living in, in Melbourne or Sydney um, just changes um, what else you can do with your life. Yes. So um, it, it, while the thought did pop into my mind once or twice, it, it wasn't there for long. Yeah, good. So, yeah, we're very fortunate in, in Bendigo in particular. I'm sure there's other regional cities out there where people do the same thing. But, yeah, it is like we were just done before. So today was my oldest son's first day at high school. Um, so it's, it's a new school for him. It's yeah, it, it's one bus stop for, ride for him, or he can walk if he wants. Um, so having those, having everything nice and close, makes things easy for us. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. Not uh, the short answer to that, mate, is no. I've never really considered moving to, yeah. to Melbourne, even though I've had you know, worked there for a good sort of twelve to fifteen years. I uh, yeah. had my career. Yeah, yep. just to, just deal with the commute. So t- talk to us about true wealth. So what is it? You're the oldest person there by the sounds of things, but but who are you working with? What are you doing? Tell us a bit about the True Wealth business. Yeah, look, it's a True Wealth is, is um, again, a self-licensed business. So um, there's uh, up and, and that's that's a new new development. So they, we've only just got our, our license. So uh, Alex, the, the, the guy who owns the business and started the business, um, it's very targeted towards um, you know, your average Australian. So- that and that's a step for me. I'm I'm sort of coming more from the private advice space. Yep. Um, and it's very much focused on um, solving. You know, the, you know, the motto as well. Uh, financial planning made simple, which is solving the simple things that that you know your average Australian has. And it's so it's a lot of superannuation and insurance, a little bit of investment. Yep. So a little bit of strategy, but but that's probably the the focus. So um, and look, that's that's something that suits me down to the ground as well. Yeah. So. Um, a lot of the people I'm speaking to are sort of in their, their, their 40 plus. Uh, they've they're at that stage of life where they're starting to think, right, I, I'm, I need to start planning for my retirement. Geez, I've still got this mortgage. What do I do from there? Mm. People are starting to take an interest in their in their superannuation, but they're probably not at the stage um, where they want to sit down and 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 go through the whole um, sort of complete. Wealth transformation that that sort of we're used to giving with sort of budgeting with all their life goals managed and very much a hey can you help me with my super can you help me with my insurance yep. and, and and look at our, our our mortgage as well so uh, is this where where do they like where where do the clients live so you know businesses in one state you live in a different state are, are the clients all over Australia are they Queensland or where, where do they all live yeah all, all over all over the state uh, sorry all over the country yeah okay um so. Uh, and that that sort of makes it interesting from a time zone perspective of when I've got clients to, so I'm going through the process of calling uh, clients for the the annual review at the moment and finding you know making sure that I'm not calling someone in WA when it's nine o'clock here or or, or something like that. But it does have some some you know there's some pluses and minuses with the time zone challenges. So yeah. you can sort of structure your day around that. But yeah, they're they're clients all over the place. So I did which that. again remove. Remove that need for an office, and um, yeah, that's where the flexibility comes in. So is, the, is the whole true wealth remote in in that sense, or like is is there an office that people go to, or is everyone just works yeah, remotely? Yeah, yeah, there's not. Yeah, there's an office in Queensland. Yeah, okay. Um, there's there's um, sort of two advisors by myself. We we work remotely. There's uh, remote power planners and admin staff. There's a couple of admin staff and a couple of Advice associates and advisors in, in the office in, in Queensland as well. Yeah, so nice. it's probably probably about fifty percent remote, fifty percent um, in the office. And that's yeah. The, there was a guy who, who lived not far from the office, but he was still working remote a couple of days a week. So because that that sort of suited his, his family and stuff. Mm-hmm. So having that that's where I say it's quite a modern firm in that you know, because of the the tools and systems and processes in place that you. Yeah, you can work from anywhere. I was up at Mount Buller last week doing some mountain bike riding, and so I was able to do a couple of meetings while I was up there, and and uh, there was no change. So yeah, uh, that that flexibility is is um, sort of 
ingrained into the business. It's how it was built from the ground up. So it's not a business that's had to transform into into that as as long long as that. Yeah, long-standing businesses have had to do over the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting. I think there's a there's a few businesses now starting to go through. People that I talk to, this businesses try to pull staff back into the office, and then it's going to be interesting to see. I think how how twenty twenty four plays out. There'll be some businesses like the one that you're working in, where you know, it, it's kind of built for that flexibility. There's others that I've had and spoken to even through last year in the podcast, where they'd actually completely ditched the office altogether and. It, like they're hot, it's a business, but everyone works in all of these different states, and there might be some people in the Philippines or wherever else they are. And so there's going to be all this, you know, these two models going forward: ones that are trying to pull people back into the office and try and get that kind of team culture and stuff happening within inside of the four walls of an office building somewhere, and then there's others that are trying to foster that through more of a remote engagement. That uh, like the business that you're working in. It is. It is a very interesting sort of trade off. Though I've, I've, I've found. Um, I, I really enjoy the building of a team culture and that camaraderie. Personally, I, I, I you know, in, in the roles where I've, I've been in leadership roles, mm. having that has helped me in that regard because you can get a, a pulse check on the room. You can you can feel what the room's like. It, it it's very much harder from a remote perspective. So um, through uh, through COVID, I was at, at Mercer. It was very difficult for me to check in on on people, and it was important to do so. But at the same time, when you remove that office as the, as the matter as the, the center stone of your business, you then you it opens up a talent pool. You can yep. have people from all all over the country. You're not looking for people to live where you live, um, or live where your office is. You um, you can have some diversity in the the days of the week that people work, the hours that people work, um, and, and you've got that sort of business resilience. And all, the overheads aren't there if you've got a smaller office or no office. Yes. So there is that balance. Yes. Um, so I think that the challenge for remote businesses is how do you build that momentum and, and culture and, and team team feeling versus uh, the opposite of that. So. Um, yeah, it, 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 it is interesting to see what firms will will sort of thrive in one environment and and not in the other. So yeah. I think it'll depend on the firm very much, and also the leadership of it. So yeah. it's it's interesting. Like I, I'm sort of someone who enjoys being in a room full of people. Um, so so working you now. This is my office. I'm in now. Uh, yeah, I still by about two o'clock. I'm sort of crawling the walls a little bit. Wanted to get out and go and find someone to have lunch with or. Take, take myself out for lunch or something. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Ultimately, you know, the, the, the people I'm hanging around now are my family. So, um, yeah, so it, it's it's very very different change for me that way, which I'm, I'm not sure I've really adapted to yet. So yeah, uh, <laughs> they they might get sick of you, and they might be sending you to a co working space in the Melbourne CBD to uh to work from to to get rid <laughs> to get rid of you for a few hours each day. I wouldn't be surprised if they haven't. So, uh, but there, there is a couple of uh, co-working spaces in Bendigo here. I'm sure I know some people that have got a spare desk. I can borrow from yeah. to, yes, to that stage. So you, you, we'll mentioned, um, when we get to you mentioned Mercer there. Can can you uh, talk a bit about your time at Mercer and, and, and what you were doing? You kind of, kind of from the little I know, and, and I'd like you to elaborate on kind of leading teams there rather than rather than being an advisor in, in Mercer, you were – Leading a team there, can you talk about what that was about? Yeah, look, that, that was that was a role. That was probably my, my the first time I was in a role where I wasn't actually giving advice as well as sort of leading teams. So prior to that, I'd I'd been at RMIT, as you know, and then before that, I had my own firm. Whereas, you know, as well as an advisor, you, you're running this firm. So um, I, that was a little bit of a transition, moving to a, a role where there's there's no client contact or clients you're speaking with it because an advisor had left or there'd been a problem or something. That so, um, it, it in some cases a little little bit like watching your kids tie your shoes. You you want know, to you want to get in there and do it for them, and, <laughs> and, but at the same time, no, the be- the best result is to let them figure it out. Um, and, and yeah, having to learn that not everyone does things that gets the best results by doing things the way I would do them. So everyone's got their own style. Everyone's got their own preferences. In in the role as an advisor, as you well know, there's there's ten things you've got to do, and some people do some of them really well. How do you, you know, what, what do you do 
when you're trying to coach or lead those people, do we focus, do we double down on the things they're good at or do we try and round them out by boosting their skills? And it depends on your business model. If your business is big enough, you can start thinking about having specializations and having support people in place, which we sort of experimented a little bit with and and you know then other other people were just really good out all rounders and got everything done. So yeah, well it was a was a transition for me to mm. to not be on the tools, so to speak. Uh, and even now, sort of being back on the tools um and, and and not running the show, that's a bit of a transition as well. So Yeah. Did you go looking for that to yeah, like yeah. as a you know to step away from the tools, so to speak, the way the way you put it? You went looking for that? For a period yeah, of time, um, yeah, that was very that was a very de- deliberate um, decision. Yes, uh, so that was um, first part of that was starting an MBA, and so, so to, to build some sort of framework and qualification around what I thought leadership was, and then after after having my own firm, I didn't want to move into uh, even before I had my own firm, I was looking for leadership experiences. In the in the, the roles I was in, I was in, worked in a couple of banks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was quite a deliberate decision to move into leadership roles, and you know, at some point that meant not being uh, a client facing advisor. So, um, but then still having the experience to to um, base how I how I ask things to be done. Yep. So yeah, it was it was quite yeah quite interesting quite interesting um, yeah. Not being, yeah, but you can be the leader, but not necessarily be in control of everyone's day to day actions and and how how that. Sort of, so what was the what was the size of the, that? What was the size of the team? The like, so was it a team of advisors you were in charge of? What what yeah, what, what was it and how many? Yeah, people? so there was advisors and associate advisors. Okay, yeah, there's about twenty four in the team at the end, yeah, right. the Victorian advice team. So yeah, um, and look, there's most of those people aren't there at, at Mercer anymore, but we do still keep in contact. So. Um, yeah, we still catch up every now and then for drinks or lunch or something like that. Usually the tennis, but I missed missed the tennis this year because uh, I was away. But um, yeah, so so that group is still fairly, you know, they've got a fairly strong friendship host working together. Yeah. So. Did and, and I haven't I haven't kept tabs on it, but does Mercer still offer financial advice? Those people have just moved on, and there's other advices there, or what, what's the what's yeah the they, they have moved on. So yeah, the MMA is still there, and the the. You know, I'd, I'd be guessing because I'm looking from the outside, yeah. uh, but they've, they've also got a very strong intra fund advice yeah, team right. as well. So the private client uh, advisor that that um, were the ones I was working with, um, there, there seems to be a few less of those. Um, but again, I'm, I'm guessing I'm sort of not not sort of well and truly in the know with what goes on anymore. Uh, but yeah, there's still there's still a couple of people there that I know, and yeah, yeah. a lot of long, people long that I don't know. Left. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So that's, that's the difference. Yeah, so could, just just on just on that leading teams piece. So uh, as I mentioned before, we pressed to record on this. I think there's uh, people that have had the opportunity to speak through as as part of this speak with as part of this podcast. There's a few people out there and businesses that are starting to get some some decent scale. They might have started off as one or two people and then have employed you know four or five advisors, their support staff, and all the rest of it. I don't, like, do you have any tips or pointers? Like, what, like, what did you find that worked well for you, and what didn't work well for you in trying to lead a team of so many people? Yeah, they you know, so I, I should write a book, shouldn't I? Yeah. I don't know if anyone read it, but um, <laughs> yeah, but it, it, there is some trial and error. So, the biggest piece of advice I'll give is listen to your team, but and be open and and sort of transparent in your conversations and your decisions. And so there, there can be um, a degree of narcissism in, in in sort of some leadership where you, you want to try and avoid that a little bit. Um, it un- understanding that while you might be leading the team, you're there to to help people in your team succeed. So you're there to you're working for them more than them sort of um, working for you. There's a there's a graphic I I keep seeing pop up on uh, you know on my Instagram feed I think, and it's the difference between a boss and a leader. Um, oh, yeah, that that sort of resonates ha- w- with me very strongly. Um, so, so the leaders that get the most out of their team are the ones that are really there to help them build their team up, not not to use the team as fodder for their own success. And there, there's a million cliches out there, but one of the one of the things is is you you praise publicly and and then you you criticise privately, not mm-hmm. the other way around. 
um, and don't take credit for your team's work. But the the most important part is clear and open and honest communication with your team so that that builds that trust. They've got trust in you as, as their leader. You've got trust in them as, as the operators. So um, that's, the, that's the place to start from, from my perspective. And it can take a little bit of, of experience as well in my own for them is you know, you, starting as, as the advisor, you do things a certain way. You know you've got no one else to, to sort of rely on. So if it doesn't get done, it's, it's yeah, right, here's the problem. Hmm. When you employ people, uh, you're actually handing over that responsibility to get the job done. And, and not everyone is immediately comfortable with that. And you can sometimes be looking over people's shoulders or micromanaging. You know, that doesn't work. You know, if, if you're micromanaging someone, either they're the wrong person or they're in the wrong business. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's the, it's not such food to put, to put, put it politely. Yeah. Um, you, you, if, if you can't say to someone, get that job done, well, here's what I'd like you to be responsible for and then have a degree of confidence that, that you're asking the right person to do the right job. Then there's probably something to think about there. Yep. The yeah, tra- trust, trust, and, st- and strength of relationship is probably the the first part. And if you haven't got that, it doesn't matter what other leadership skills or, or talents that your your team have. Yep. In the struggle, you're going to struggle, aren't you? Yep. So you, you've also yeah. spent a bit of time in the university, working in the university system. So I said at the start, you bounced around a few different places. So yeah. People will know you from from all different spots. Um, how did you end up? Yeah. How did you end up there? Uh, look at the. You know, with uh, with my business, when that was won't go won't get into the weeds on that one, but that was that was sort of a, a light sale back to the light and see that didn't go as planned, uh, and, and so look, I, the opportunity came up at RMIT. They were looking for you know experienced financial planner to to um, as a um, industry fellow was the title I had. And my, my role there is as well as sort of teaching students was to connect the university to, to industry, which. I think worked very well with the FBA at the time, and and um, you know that's where we met because mm-hmm. one of the assignments was for students to go out and find a, a an active advisor and ask them to to critique their work, and uh, so you, you one of my students reached out to you, and and then that sort of worked really well. So uh, that's how I, I got there, and then um, after it was after probably eight months of the call of the wild in the form of Mercer. I was back in into um, you know the in, in into the profession. Um, I still do a little bit work for Victoria University as well. So they're in their online degree again, hundred percent online. So I get to do that from from home, um, and that's on a unit by unit basis. So I'll be doing a little bit more for Victoria University later this year, um, and that's just something I enjoy. You you, you get to talk to. Um, people who want to be a part of your profession, a lot of career changes because it is, a, a, again, it's an online degree you can do at your own pace. So most of the students are career changes. So that I can I can relate to because there's usually people sort of my age or not, not you know, somewhere close to my age. We're very different to teaching sort of um, people who have just come out of high school. So, mm. and it, it, for, um, yeah, I, 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 I really enjoy it. Yeah. My experience on the other side of that, like as you said, I, that, RMIT course, they had to, uh, I think they had to present some advice to an to an advisor. I had to pretend to be the client, and there was a case study and and so forth. I did that a bit with with you at RMIT, and did it a couple of a couple of times years ago with Deacon had a similar kind of thing and done underway, and we actually found it was an incredible recruitment uh, activity for the for the business. As a, uh, it felt nice to be giving back and and helping the helping uh, those coming through. I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that too, but. But a byproduct of it, unintended, in the first instance, when I first went along to them, is this is this kind of gets the business name out there and this opportunity to talk to people. And you could, like, there was one one time, like, someone someone presented to me. Now I'm like, this is amazing. Like, this, I'm convinced this person presented this advice better than one of our advisors would have presented this advice. They must have practiced and practiced <laughs> and practiced and practiced so much, scribbled their name I'm, I'm down. I'm sure and- it was there. Sure, it was helping him out. <laughs> yeah. man. Be- you, you had a lot to do with it, but I, I could remember writing their name down. And, and anyway, we reached out to them. I can't remember if they ended up working with us, but there was some someone else that uh, I ended up that was working with me for a little while. She present. She was a deacon and, and presented her advice to me, and I was blown away by how she presented this advice to me. 
And then a few years later, she's ended up working for us. And I said, do you remember you presented advice, that advice to me? And she had not, she couldn't remember that she presented the advice to me, but I remembered her because it, like, it was so impressive. Yeah. And anyway, she went through a few different roles at our business before moving on to something else. So it, it is a big, it is an yeah, incredible it, opportunity to find young, great young people that you might be able to employ in your business eventually. Absolutely, and look, that that's quite a common scenario. What it, it was quite common for students who have yeah. gone through that that um, sort of work integrated learning program or process and come back with with some sort of offer. Even when we had, had those events, so we, we ran jointly with the FPA. Um, there was a lot of practices there who were, we were on a recruitment drive. They yeah. were looking for, for graduates. There's, uh, I think we've still got a thirst for, for new entrants to, to join us. So, yeah, if, if you're a growing practice, I can thoroughly recommend getting involved with the universities because the universities do want practitioners involved in their programs. And, and yeah, it is a good way to... To spot, spot the up and coming talent, and you know, I think back to a, to a lot of the students I've met, and you, you you see them progressing and winning awards, and and you know putting out great content on on the likes of LinkedIn and Facebook and those sort of things. It, it really just shows that some of the good talent comes through. And there, there's a lot of a lot of people um, studying financial planning. There's uh, there's a lot of talk about you know where where our next generation going to come from. But then the, the first year subjects for I remember at RMIT. It, had a couple hundred students in each each first year subject. Yeah. So um, there are many people who are thinking about advice as a profession. Um, so yeah, the, the the work that universities do, the FAA doing now as well on, on engaging um, new entrants. Um, I think the only benefit is going forward. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you yeah, might whether you can recall or not, but back when you were in the Working in the university system, so you've got a few hundred people doing that kind of first year financial planning subject. Do you have a sense of how many were continuing on with it after that? Can you recall it all? Okay. So I had the yeah, I had the um, you know the, the privilege of being the, the coordinator for the capstone subject, so the final yeah you know, um, subject, and there wasn't a couple hundred people in that class, but there was twenty or thirty people who had gone through their degree and they were at the stage they hadn't done financial planning as an elective. Or they'd, you know, they'd, they'd done the double degree there with accounting and financial planning. There's some really, really good operators in, in that sort of twenty to thirty, and that's that's some twice a year. Yeah. So, and that that's one university twice a year. There's twenty to thirty people coming out with, excuse me, an appropriate qualification, and the smart students are looking sort of mid midway through their final year. That's when they're starting to look for internships and, and opportunities to start moving in, into um, into business. So. If they haven't already done so, so um, yeah, there is that's that's where you'll find the the cream of the crop. Mm. Yes, yeah, our, our, if I look back at you know our experience over over years, yeah, it's been we've, we've managed to pick up someone and you know, just through the jobs job ads on Seek or wherever it may be, but uh, uh, quite often they they're in the last half or the last year or so of their uni degree, and so they work a few days a week, and then a few days a week they're studying, and then all of a sudden. They finished and they're full time. There's a couple of guys that just graduated last. Well, they finished last year. They had their graduation late late last year and uh, and are now working full time, doing doing really well uh, in our business. So you mentioned a couple of times through there you had your own business. Maybe didn't finish up quite how you had you know had, had planned it at the end there. But but putting that that yes. bit aside, what can you talk us through your own business and what like what what made you want to what made you do want to do your own thing, and and now you're obviously working as an employee. You, you've gone back into that into that uh, part of advice. But talk about your journey running your own business. Yeah, look, that that was a bit of an eye opener. Yeah. Um, that yeah, and that had come from seeing my dad grow his advice business from you know from scratch. And in, in in the the old days where to start a, an advice business, you just needed a phone and a phone book. Um, I mean, you you got started from there. Um, that so so. I kind of always wanted that at the, in the end, um, and so, so I, I sort of bought a couple of businesses and put them together and, and to make one. And the process of assuming that relationship of trust that clients had had with the previous advisor was um, really hammered home how important the relationship between an advisor is and their clients and that that 
amount of trust you're given is huge. Um, and so, so being able to work through that was uh, was a pleasure, and, and was able to grow and transform the business a little bit. Um, I did enjoy sort of owning the business and being able to to put all all these ideas I'd had in my mind when I was working at banks and other firms prior to that that, that sort of weren't sort of enacted upon. I was like, right, well, if, when I'm running the show, I was like, okay, well, let's see what happens when it does work. And look, it, it's it it was great to be able to say, well, this is how I want to do things. This is how I this is what I want my firm to stand for, and this is how I want the advice to look and feel. And you know, if you had a broad idea on Monday, it was in place on Friday. <laughs> and then you, know, you knew if it would, if you, you, you knew I, if it was going to work or not within a week or two. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> as opposed to having to make decisions by committee, which probably doesn't suit me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And particularly in sort of big, bigger organisations, I kind of got well. This is how it should be done, and then and sometimes I struggle to hear other opinions. But I'll put <laughs> um, put that politely. But but yeah. So so that was probably. What I enjoyed about that, and seeing, you know, seeing a lot of the things I put in place work, a lot of things put in place gave value to clients, and some of the things I put in place just did not work. Yeah, and that, that's a good learning, learning. And then at the end of the day, you know, you've got no one else to 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 blame for that. Yeah, I'll write this call. It did work. Pat myself on the back. Or it didn't work. Okay, what what did we learn and 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 move forward or not? So, so yeah, it was. Um, a little bit lonely as well. Like you're in a in a in a building full of people, or in an office full of ten or twelve people at one point there. Uh, but you still don't really. You, everything comes to you, and 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 it's really just you making all the decisions at the end of the day. You got input, you got people to talk to, but yeah, it can be can feel a little bit like you like you're on your own. But yeah, so you're ten, you're ten or twelve people. You had ten or twelve people in your business at one stage. Yeah, you, you, yep. so you well so and tr- well and truly grew it then, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, it grew, it grew pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, and and also uh, that was a function of the service proposition as well. So we sort of had quite a a very strong hand holding approach to to how we looked after clients. We had a lot of clients who were in retirement phase, and a part of our um, service was that we we were agents. Well, we were working with Centrelink directly. So um, that was one of the things that particularly people that had Centrelink um, pensions. I really valued as part of our offering was that they didn't have to talk to Centrelink, so they didn't have yep. to line up. Uh, you know, if Centrelink sent them a notice, if they received something from from Centrelink, chances are when they called the office, we got it the day before and and had already sort of worked on what what it meant for them. So they could, if if we got something, call them. Hey, we have got this from Centrelink. You get it tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Well, what it means is this. Or what we're going to do is we've given the information they need, and then you have to worry about it. So yeah, right. That was probably one of the strongest ones. So. It was quite a, um, I'll call it a labour-intensive value proposition, and so that's why we had had sort of more people. Um, yep. we did. A, a review was was quite thorough. So for an annual review, it did involve going over the the our know, sort of client data collection as well. So reviewing all of their goals and, and taking those into consideration, and and yeah, our reviews were done through a statement of advice each year. Yeah, but, sure. Um, that was. Quite, quite, yeah. Labor, I call it labor intensive, but um, you know the client's got a lot of value out of it. Yeah. Um, Would you do it again? Would you go back to your own business again, or you've you've done that now and and where you're at in your life, you you wouldn't you wouldn't do it again? Yeah, no, I probably, I probably would. Probably yeah. would a bit later on though, when the kids are a little bit older and and those sort of things. So um, yeah, well, I wouldn't wouldn't rule it out. It's not yeah. not sort of on the immediate uh, radar, but. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, um, you said yeah, like- absolutely. And and I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it differently, completely different again. I'll do it without debt. That that'll be a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that'll be one less thing to worry about. Yeah, um, I suppose it's also probably starting at a different life. At a uh, doing it at a different stage in your life. You know, I imagine back then, you know, whether you had kids or not back then, but you're young with a mortgage and all of these kind of things, and and you know, you you. Maybe if you did it again, kids are a little bit older. They're less less dependent on you. You've got some savings and things behind you, so you're not borrowing money to buy businesses. You can set yourself up to start it from scratch if well, you went and did it. If, if I was to do it again, I'd start from scratch. Yeah, so and and just build it. And you know, I, I, I think back. I reckon I was about my age that Dad started his business. So um, 
which he he seemed a lot older than I am now, though. But um, <laughs> of course, yeah, <laughs> just just like your kids would say about you. <laughs> yeah, oh, they they can be some over the hill. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so where yeah, to from the, here? The, the, where to from here for for you? What what what's on the cards next? Got any grand plans? Oh, I've got a couple, a couple of uh, off the field um, objectives. So I've, yeah. uh, I'll be be starting my uh, training as a pilot. So I'm going to get in pilot, oh, yeah, right. which is something that I've, I've threatened to do for, for well since I was in high school, really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, you know, from going to be not commuting, um, I think maybe trying to tick off a few of those um, important life goals that sort of have been put put on the back burner. Um, so that's I've signed up to do that. Yeah. Um, that's actually, <laughs> ironically, going back to university RMIT. So RMIT's flight school is here in Bendigo. Okay. Um, so, so that's uh, that's, yeah. the, that's the way I've chosen to do that. So that, that should be interesting. How um, long does that? How long being does that a take? Again. How long does that take you? Uh, it, flat out, it's two years. So, um, which see that that's soon enough for me. Uh, but yeah, it, it's just one of those. Um, one of those things where you, you probably need to start focusing on on your own goals, but not necessarily your own business or career goals. Some of your lifestyle goals as well, which yeah. I, you know, I do a lot of do a lot of mountain bike riding and those sort of things, which is great. But a um, couple of these other things that have been on the list for a bit, it's like, okay, let's let's start. Um, it sounds it's starting to sounds like I'm having a little bit of a midlife crisis, doesn't it? Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, that that's that's probably the the most exciting thing for me outside of work this year. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, that's yep. other than that, um, sort of relatively fresh at True Wealth. So there's a little bit to be done there. One of the things that I've been tasked with is adding a self managed super fund capability to the business. So oh, yeah, right. Um, starting to grow that, and and again that'll be all organic and and also looking for existing clients that have got a, an appetite for something beyond platforms. Um, yeah. So is that is that like from an accounting function, from an accounting perspective? Do you mean SMSF? Or what, what do you mean by no? From from an advice. Oh, I just offer it as an advice. From an advice. part of your advice. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Look, self managed fund isn't something that uh, True Wealth had, had done a lot of in the past. So mm-hmm. so you're just sort of fleshing out what that value proposition looks like and and um, uh, putting that, that structure in place, which we're, we're doing at the moment. So yep. Um, one one client's just finalised at the moment. So. Uh, hopefully, we can grow that to be a a many part of the business. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And so, you at True Wealth, are you taking over some existing client relationships? Like you mentioned, you kind of you mentioned before about booking and review meetings, and you need to be conscious of if someone's in Perth and and, and you're not. Uh, is is that so? You're yeah. taking over some some advice relationships and then helping to grow the business in other ways too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, it's it's we've got quite a lot of clients. So. Um, yeah, taking over some of that those existing relationships, um, and seeing what else is in there, um, and as you, you know yourself, if you service your clients well, then there'll be continual advice opportunities. So, True. so making sure you know, sometimes a set of fresh eyes helps with that as well. Good. All right, Ash. Well, thanks for joining me today. Pleasure to catch up with you. It's been a a while since we've since we've done so, but uh, do it in the form of a podcast this time. And and if you do find yourself. Closer to the city, let me know. And we'll uh, we'll we'll catch up in person. Yeah, look, I, I do get down there a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, it's always a pleasure to have a chat, mate. I enjoy watching your uh, your content, um, uh, particularly the the Legos. And yeah, uh, I've, I've never known anyone for, uh, you know the fact that you've had the, the success you've had on TikTok is amazing. So yeah, um, working. I don't, working I don't think well. I'll find myself on TikTok anytime soon. <laughs> nah, nah. I'll be safe. You won't be coming to compete with <laughs> no. me. Thanks, Ash. No, no, I don't don't, don't think I can match you, mate. Thank (laughs) you.